Asian time, mm-hmm. after. Mm-hmm. Allah Akbar. Mm-hmm. How are you, Mizan? Are you okay? Mm-hmm. How was uh, Birmingham? <coughs> Should I just make your uncle? Uh, I don't know which one, the one that I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I'm calling you. Mm-hmm. Jersey, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah just right now. He dropped off. Uh, Sheikh Khabib. I told him, we're in a rush, so whenever you have peace. No pressure. Allahu Akbar. It's so cold. Allahu Akbar Our typical Asian time starts We say 9 o'clock and we start at 9.15 I'm changing to half eight and then start at 9 o'clock That's why in weddings, you know, if you put on the reception that, you know, 1 o'clock is reception All of your white guests and non-Muslim guests will come at one o'clock, and the Asians would come at two thirty or probably three o'clock. Take it, we stand, inshallah. Bismillah, you are Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, you are Bin Alameen, while I keep on in Mutahin. والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وإمام المتقين وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله مع الصابرين وقال سبحانه وتعالى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم اتق الله واصبري أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم يا رب العالمين زدنا علما بالقرآن العظيم وبسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين Tonight is the tenth lesson of Riyadh al-Salihin The famous book of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi and here in Riyadh al-Salihin, Imam Nawawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he focuses on those aspects of our life where we really need to work on. And those aspects of our life where, inshallah, through improving our character, through improving ourselves, we will become better people on the face of this earth, in the eyes of the people, but more so in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way Riyadh al-Salihin, it is... Gardens, meaning beautiful flowers and beautiful pearls from the sayings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if we can live in accordance to these pearls and these beautiful flowers, not only will we make a beautiful garden in this world, but definitely inshallah, inshallah, in Jannatul Firdaus, we will have a very beautiful garden also. Before I start, I know there's a very dear friend of mine listening. 
uh, just before hadith class, uh, a dear friend of mine returned from Umrah with his family, his wife and his children. And uh, he wanted to see me in a rush before hadith class. And I was a bit worried. I was tired. I was trying to prepare. And he goes, I want to see you. And I go, that's fine. So rather than him coming over to see him, he actually came to the school uh, just before hadith class. He just finished uh, shopping with his wife and his kids. And he gave me this scarf. So I'm not doing a mufti mink. I'm just wearing this scarf because he asked and requested me to wear this scarf. This scarf is from Medina Munawwara. And he said that I wish that whilst you are reciting the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you wear this scarf which is from Medina Munawwara. And I bought it from Medina Munawwara. And I also used it whilst praying in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he happened to pray in the green carpet area, which is the Jannah. What is it called? Jannah. Rawdat Jannah. Rawdat Jannah. The place... Uh, the carpet space from wherein the member and to the blessed um, <coughs> end of the masjid and to the qabr, Jannatul Baqi, which is the place known as Rawdatul Min Riyadil Jannah, a garden and that area which will be lifted and taken to Jannah also. So he was blessed to pray there and he gave this scarf. So to fulfill his wish, I'm wearing this scarf. So I pray that Allah Ta'ala accepts his very beautiful gift mm-hmm. and Allah makes a means of goodness and barakah for me and for us all. We're on the chapter of Sabr, so last week we've completed the chapter of that young boy and the, when he met the magician, when he met the king, and we concluded that chapter. Now Imam uh, Nawi rahmatullahi alayhi wants to continue on, so from hadith number 31. This hadith, if you guys remember two weeks ago, my respected teacher, Sheikh Murana Kamaluddin, Hafidahullah, who came and spoke to us, when he started his nasiha and his advice, he actually started off with this hadith. And I'm going to repeat the same hadith and mention them very points that my respected teacher mentioned. So Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi mentions this hadith. وَعَنْ أَنَسٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُمْ قَالْ مَرَّ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِمْرَأَةٍ تَبْكِي عِنْدَ قَبْرٍ فَقَالْ أَنَسْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُ Who is Anas? Anas is that very companion who was blessed to spend 10 years in the company of the Prophet ﷺ as his attendee and as one who served the Prophet ﷺ. And his khala, his auntie, was married to Rasulullah ﷺ, our beloved mother, Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. Anas says that the Prophet ﷺ regarding him, that the Prophet of Allah, he went by a woman who was standing by a grave. So Rasulullah passed by a woman who was standing by a grave. We find in the hadith of Sahih Muslim that she was crying tabki ala sabiyin laha. She was crying because she lost her own child. So she was standing by this grave of her child. She had lost her young child, a child who did not reach the age of maturity, so passed away young. So we're talking a child who might have been five, six, seven, eight years old. Nothing more. Faqala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger of Allah seeing her cry profusely, seeing her in this state, he went past and said to her, Fear Allah, be conscious of Allah and be patient. فَقَالَتْ She replied, إِلَيْكَ عَنِّي Leave me alone. Leave me alone. فَإِنَّكَ لَمْ تُصَبِّ مُصِيبَتِي well, I'm going through, you're not going through that. Leave me alone. She, that's the way she spoke to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? وَلَمْ تَعْرِفُ she didn't recognize that that was the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa She didn't know it was him. So someone just came to her and said to her, that, Fear Allah and be patient. She said, Ilayka anni, leave me alone. You don't know what I'm going through. So who are, who are you to say to me, leave me alone? You know when people, when you say to someone that, Don't worry, I understand, I know you're going through a hard time. And they reply out of hurt, out of that upsetness. That, no, you don't know what I'm going through. Leave me alone. So this woman replied in the exact same way. When she said this, Faqira laha. Later it was said to her, إِنَّهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. That was the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was Rasulullah that you just spoke to. That was Rasulullah that you spoke to in that way. Here the ulama mentioned, and this is what my respected uh, teacher mentioned also. She was crying. She was hurt that she lost her child. But as soon as she was told that you spoke with disrespect to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that concern and that grief for her child didn't remain anymore. She was now grieved and concerned because she has upset Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah on his commentary of Riyadh al-Sali mentions this beautiful point. 
that the fact that she has upset Rasulullah, that she spoke to him like this, she's forgotten about her child. What does my child mean? What does that grief mean when now my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is upset with me? That meant more to her now. With this, فَأَتَتْ بَابَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, She rushed to the door of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. How could I speak to him like that? How could I say to him, leave me alone? You know, what was I doing? I didn't even know it was him. You know, for example, if someone of you know, a high caliber of respect comes and speaks to them, we don't know who or she is, and we speak to them part of way, and then later we find out, we feel like, yeah Allah, what have I done? And how dare I speak to that person that way? She didn't know. And she's speaking to the prince of mankind, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she rushed to the house of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She says, فَلَمْ تَجِدْ عِنْدَهُ بَوَّابِينَ When I went to his house, you know, you'd expect being a king, being the greatest man to ever set foot on the face of this earth, you'd expect bodyguards, you'd expect security, as is the case with every other king. Every other king, queen, they have bodyguards. Even our queen, she has bodyguards that just stand all day outside Buckingham Palace and they do a few marches and they you know, make a few sounds and a few noises and that's all they do. Rasulullah has no bodyguard and she recognizes this, that he's the king, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the greatest of all of mankind. He doesn't have any bodyguard. So she goes, فَقَالَتْ لَمْ أَعْرِفْكَ O Messenger of Allah, I didn't recognize you. I didn't know it was you. I'm really sorry. I didn't know it was you that I was speaking to. I'm really sorry. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa replies to her saying, فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ الصَّدْمَةِ الْأُولَى Indeed, true patience is on the onset of the calamity. That as soon as you are faced with the difficulty, at that moment, it's about suppressing my feelings. At that moment, it's about gulping them very sour, bitter pills. And, okay, this has happened. I need to control myself. I need to stay focused. And to realize that there's more to this. So this is what Rasulullah was teaching this woman. And he said to her, and the key to any sort of patience is ittaqillah. That she was told that you need to fear Allah. You need to be conscious of Allah. So you don't do anything contrary to the way of Allah. So that you don't, you know, respond in a negative way. You don't make certain comments. And it's upsetting. I've, I've been in situations where someone has passed away, I've been to their home, and then you can hear our women folk crying and saying, why has Allah taken my child? Why has Allah taken my father? Why has Allah taken my mother? Such utterances is very, very detrimental. Sometimes such statement, statements are said that it's possible that you are very close to be a very disobedient servant of Allah with these remarks, you know, making these comments. It's the will of Allah, it's the decree of Allah. There's only so much I can do. And Rasulullah is saying to this woman, that, yeah, you're standing, you're in grief, but fear Allah. Keep in mind that everything is from Allah. You need to keep in mind Allah is still your creator. He allowed this to be. And have patience. Allah, allow me and you to really recognize the way this woman re realized the very crucial point of life, which is, it's not about making everyone else unhappy. If Rasulullah is displeased, I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah, the greatest feeling of sadness is to know that your Rasul isn't happy with you. And the Sahabiyah, she's a female companion, she felt it. You know, the fact that I've lost my child doesn't mean anything. And we find this exact same principle of love and how much care they had for Rasulullah at the time of Uhud. At the Battle of Uhud, many of you know of the, of the story, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he was injured to the extent that from his blessed teeth, so his tooth was chipped, sallallahu alayhi wa He was bleeding from his jaw. A few metal links from the blessed helmet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went inside the cheek of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa One companion, whilst trying to attempt to take out the links, the metal links, from the cheek of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his own teeth fell out, trying to take these links out. When you try to grip something, you don't have too much grip, and you're gripping with your teeth, his own teeth fell out. And rumors spread across the battlefield in Uhud, that Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has been martyred, he's passed away. And this news reached all the way to Medina Munawwara. And we find in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, in the chapter of Kitab al-Maghazi, wherein a woman, and because there were the ulama, Hafiz ibn Hajj al-Asqalani says, it wasn't one woman. 
So we don't know her name. It was actually few women. This incident took place with few women, not one, few women. But then they, uh, they specify to say one woman, for example, she received the news that Rasulullah has been martyred. Chaos in Medina, that the messenger of Allah has been martyred. So now she runs out of her home and she runs all the way to the outskirts of Medina waiting for the rest of the companion Sahaba to return. To you know, to know is this true? Has Rasulullah actually passed away? Has been martyred? The first few companions return. They look injured, tired. She asks, that, Kaifa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? How is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? She receives the news that, are you such a such a woman? Yes. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Your father has passed away. Your father was killed in the battle of Uhud. That's what she says. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. To Allah we belong. To him is our return. Lakin, kaifa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? But how is the Prophet of Allah? I want to know how easy. No one knows. They don't know either. The Sahaba was scattered. They didn't know. That was Rasulullah alive, and only those around him knew that the Messenger of Allah is safe. She goes further out, another person comes and says to her, she asks, how is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? She receives the news, are you such a such a woman? Yes. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'un. Your husband, such a such a person, has been marked in the battle of Uhud. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'un. But how is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Third time she receives the news that your son has been martyred. Father, husband, son, every male member of your family has been martyred, which in society means you have no one. You have no one to look after you. You have no one. You have no one to be there for you as a man in the family. You've lost son, you've lost husband, you've lost your father. But she still asks, how's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I want to know about him. Then on the fourth occasion, she receives the news that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is injured, he has been hurt, He's returning to Medina Munawwara. He's alive and well. Alhamdulillah, he's coming back. Guess what she says? No, that's not enough for me. I need to see him to believe that he's okay. She waits on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Messenger of Allah comes, and she sees the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She goes next to him. It is mentioned in one narration we find she actually holds on to the. The clothing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, O Messenger of Allah, I've lost my father, I've lost my husband, I've lost my son, I've lost every sort of kinship, I've lost everyone. But I swear by Allah, after seeing you, no grief remains a grief, no sadness remains sadness. By seeing you, I have everything, though I've lost everything. That's how much Rasulullah meant to them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this woman, she's lost a child, but the mere fact that my Rasul is potentially upset with me, that was enough for her to forget her child, to forget that part of her that she lost. She was more concerned about finding out where my Rasul is and for I, so I can say sorry to him, because it's possible that he was upset with me. The next hadith. When Abi Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, anna Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal, Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentions from Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who says, يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَزَّ وَجَلْ A hadith Qudsi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مَا لِعَبْدِ الْمُؤْمِنِ عِنْدِي جَزَاءٌ Indeed there is no reward for a believing servant of mine إِذَا قَبَدْتُ سَفِيَّتَهُ مِنْ أَهْلِ الدُّنْيَا When I take away a beloved member of his family Someone beloved to him When I take away this person, this beloved person from this my servant's life when I take them away, so it could be a husband, it could be a father, it could be your mother, it could be your wife, it could be your children, whoever. When I take such a beloved person, Safiya, a beloved person from my servant, ثُمَّ And he or she anticipates in reward from me. That I have to stay patient, I have to stay patient. Allah will reward me, Allah will reward me. I've lost my father, I need to keep going. I've lost my child, I need to keep going. I've lost my mother, I need to keep going. Illa al-Jannah. But the only reward for that person is Allah says, I will give that person Jannah. Mm -hmm. If they can be patient from this. So when we lose people, yes, it's very painful. Losing someone beloved to you. I don't think there can be any far greater pain than to lose someone beloved to, to you. But Allah promises me and you something in return. That yeah, you've had to feel some emotion when you've lost someone. 
But if you can stay firm on deen, if you can stay firm on holding on to salah, holding on to patience, then the reward I'm going to give you is, I'm going to give you jannah for that. So whilst losing a beloved of ours in this world, not only will you be given jannah, there is hope in Allah you will be reunited with that person in jannah. But we have to have that condition of, Oh Allah, it's your decree, the time has come. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep striving. I'm not going to let losing this person in my life stop me. I'm not going to let that be the end of my life. <coughs> and the reality is, those of us sitting here, those of us that have our parents, Alhamdulillah. <coughs> so it's possible a day comes in our lives when we'll have to lose our parents. Those of us that are fathers sitting here, it's possible that Allah tests you by taking your child in front of you. It's possible. But at that moment, we have to have sabr. We have to have that hope in Allah. That my Allah will treat me with goodness. Allah will give me goodness. And if you have that sort of mind, your promise from Allah is, Allah will give you Jannah. وعن عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها أن سألت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن الطاعون أو بلوفد مدى عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها she says that she, she asked رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم regarding طاعون طاعون means plague in the lifetime of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم there were six plagues that were known in the lifetime of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he was given news that there, are, there is a plague how many times over? Six times. So there were six different plagues that took uh, place in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Aisha asked, O Messenger of Allah, I want to ask you regarding plagues. فَأَخْبَرَهَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ عَذَابًا يَبْعَثُهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاء Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's Rasul said that, O oh Aisha, it is a punishment from Allah. Allah, whoever he wishes to, he punishes with this plague. It is a form of punishment. When there is much wrong on the face of this earth, Allah Ta'ala has his way of cleansing the earth. And one way is to take away the sinners from the face of this earth. So here Rasulullah said, it is a means of punishment. But, فَجَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى رَحْمَةً لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Whilst it is punishment for some, if a believer is in a plague, that in his village or in his city, in his town there is a plague, it is a means of mercy for that person. It is a means of rahma for that person. فَلَيْسَ مِنْ عَبْدٍ يَقْعُ فِي الطَّاعُونَ Indeed, any servant that is placed in a plague, فَيَمْكُثُ فِي بَلَدِي صَابِرًا مُحْتَسِبًا And that person remains. He doesn't leave or she doesn't leave that town. They remain in that town, in the afflicted area. They don't go out to spread the plague. With patience and with the hope, يَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ لَا يُصِيبُهُ إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ and knowing that only that thing will come to me if Allah wishes it upon me. I will only be afflicted with this plague if it's meant to be. But they don't leave. They take the means. They use the means of this world which is don't let the disease spread. If it's in a certain community, in a certain tribe, you all stay in that tribe and you allow the disease to die off in that tribe. No one should come in. No one should leave that area. If they do this, إِلَّا كَانَ لَهُ مِثْلُ أَجْرِ الشَّهِيدِ Then Allah Ta'ala promises that person that Allah will give them the reward of a shaheed, of a person who has strived in the path of Allah and who has lost their life. What's the reward of a shaheed? We find in another hadith that before their blood is to drop on the face of this earth, every single past sin of theirs is forgiven and they're given jannah. On the day of Qiyamah, such a person will rise that his blood or her blood will be such, it will be in the color of blood, but it will be as fragrant and as beautiful as musk and amber. This is the reward of a person who gives himself or herself in the path of Allah, as was the occasion and as was at that time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the conditions of taking part in such affairs was there. So here, it is a means of mercy for you. So now the question is, why am I going through illness? Why do I have cancer for? Why do I have cancer? What did I do wrong? What did such a such a person do wrong that we find out tomorrow brain cancer? Mm. You didn't do anything wrong. You haven't done anything <coughs> wrong. It is a means of mercy for you. What kind of mercy? The ulama explain upon this point that if you know that you've got cancer and the doctor says to you, I'm sorry, sir, madam, whoever you are, you've only got six months. We can only help you. We feel as though after six months, that's it now. End of your time. Isn't that a mercy from Allah? Because in them six months, are you going to be busy trying to disobey Allah? Or are you going to be busy saying, Oh Allah, I'm going soon. 
I need to rectify my way. I need to make up for all the wrongs that I've done. I need to ask forgiveness from everyone. And I need to connect myself back to you. It's mercy. Why? Because Allah said to you, someone might die all of a sudden in an accident, in a car accident. No preparation. That person, why is there mercy? Because you're afflicted with cancer. You're afflicted with a serious disease, with a serious illness. But that's a wake up call. Allah is saying to you that, look, I've told you now. I've told you, so you've got to mend your way. In my own life, who did I learn this lesson from? I learned it from my beloved mother, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. May Allah Ta'ala shower his mercy upon her. May Allah enlighten her grave. She had pancreas cancer. So she was diagnosed, I think, approximately one year before she passed away. But my mother didn't want us to know. Because she thought we were going to be upset. Because she thought we were going to cry. So I think only my elder sister and my father knew at that time that my mum had a pancreas cancer. But in that time, because I was in Leicester and I was studying, I remember the last Ramadan in her life, uh, before she passed away. Obviously she couldn't fast, she was in the hospital bedridden. Um, she wanted to give the fidya, which is for missing the fasting of Ramadan, she wanted to complete it. So after the Ramadan ended, she lived on another approximate 7-8 months. In that time, whilst I was at Leicester, she said to me, Oh, I missed the 30 days of Ramadan. I've made up the other Ramadans, please can you give the Sa'a, which is the Fidya equivalent to about £2.53 per fast, can you give this away to charity for me? So she started clearing her name with that. She owed some money to some uh, shops, you know, when you go to Saudi shops and stuff and you leave, what is it, credit and you say, I'm going to pay later. So within them eight months, she started to clear all that, that I don't want to leave anything behind, I don't want to leave behind any personal debt. She started to speak to her family members, asking everyone, everyone for forgiveness, slowly, 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 slowly. She started to give us advice, her children, and she used to talk to us about certain things. Why? Because she, she knew her time is coming. And that's a mercy from Allah. Just the fact that you know that it's time for me to go. You can prepare. So isn't that a mercy? Indeed, it's a mercy from Allah. So if you know of someone that's going through that hard time, don't make them down. Don't feel depressed either. Don't feel like, yeah, Allah, dad's got cancer, mum's got cancer, such and such a person's got cancer. Let's, let's turn it on the table. Alhamdulillah, you're blessed. You're so blessed. <laughs> Allah is giving you a chance to turn back. Allah is saying to you, you've got time. You can, come, you can mend your ways. And at the same time, it's a lesson for me and you. That if my mum can go with cancer, it's possible that in my life I have cancer. It's possible that I will be given that wake-up call. And at the same time, it's possible I won't be given that wake-up call. So I've got to learn from her. I have to see the cancer in someone else to find out the wake-up call in myself. And that's what's needed. So every affliction that Allah gives a person, indeed, there is much reward to it. I asked a question before today's lesson. Some people are born blind. Some believers, non-believers are born blind. Some are not bl born blind, but they eventually become blind. What's that all about? Has Allah ever said anything regarding the blind? Mm. Our Allah, my Allah, your Allah says something. And it's not just a hadith where Rasulullah says it. It's a hadith Qudsi where Allah informs us. So this hadith is mentioned by Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala who says, وَعَنْ أَنَسٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَنْهُ قَالْ سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقُولْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ قَالْ Anas says, I heard from my beloved صلى الله عليه وسلم who says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِذَا بْتَلَيْتُ عَبْتِي بِحَبِيبَتَيْهِ فَصَبَرَ عَوَّدْتُهُ مِنْهُمَ الْجَنَّةِ When I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, afflict my servant by the means of these two beloved items of his. Habibatayhi. Two beloved items. What are them two beloved items? يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ عَيْنَيْهِ I afflict him with his eyes, i.e. I take away his eyesight. He is born blind or in his lifetime he loses his eyes. What's going to happen? Allah says regarding him, awwattuhu. I will repay that person. I will repay him minhuma for him giving away and for him losing or not even being given his eyesight minhuma al-jannah. I will repay him with jannah. On the basis of his, uh, of his eyes. There's a very beautiful quote which is worth mentioning. Once an old man was asked, oh, You've been born blind, a man who's 70, 80 years old, you've been born blind. How do you feel? Muslim, how do you feel? 
How do you feel that you've been born blind? Never have you seen the beautiful colors of the world. Never have you seen your family members. Never have you seen anything. So listen to his reply. And I swear by Allah, those listening at home and everyone listening here and wherever my voice will go, listen to the way this person has understood the command of Allah and the system of Allah. This old man says, who is blind from birth, never seen a thing. He goes, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All praises to Allah. How can I not be happy? My Allah, meaning his Allah, my Allah has looked after me so well that he doesn't want me to see anything except for him on the day of judgment. He doesn't want me to see anything. He doesn't want me to see the world, the beauties and the fakeness of the world. He doesn't want me to see the lies of the world. He doesn't want me to see the sorrows of the world. He has reserved my sight on the day of judgment just so that I can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that I can see Jannah, so I can see the beauties of Jannah. So there's no point for me to see anything in this world. That's the way, you know, me and you think, because we're not in these situations, we think a blind person, a disabled person, or someone who's got some sort of deficiency, that they go through a hard time. Wallahi al-Azim, if a person is connected to Allah, you ask them, that, you know, you're in a wheelchair, how do you feel? Let them reply to you saying that, Alhamdulillah, I'm in a wheelchair, but I know that in Jannah I'll be walking. Someone that's blind, let them reply to you the way this old man replied. Someone, for example, you know, who's going through another deficiency, another problem in their life. Wallahi al-Azim, it is a means of goodness. And they see like that. And me and you, because it's on the outset, we can't see what they see. Why do they feel like that? Because they have Allah in their life. Because they know there's something called Allah, there's my Allah who's going to reward me. There is something more after this world. Just because I don't have my eyesight today, it doesn't mean anything. But let me warn you at the same time. There are some people who Allah speaks about that they had eyes in this world, but on the day of Qiyamah, on the second to last side of Para 16, Surah to Maryam, uh, Surah to Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there will be some on the day of judgment. They will be resurrected blind. And they will say to Allah, Oh my Allah, in this very world we had eyes. Oh my Allah, in this very world we had, we had eyes. Why today have I been resurrected blind? Allah Ta'ala from him, the angels will reply that on the world and in the world you went away, you, made a, you kept a blind eye to the remembrance of Allah, you kept a blind eye to the Qur'an, to the way of Allah, to the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so today you don't deserve to see anything, today you don't deserve to see anything, and that person will be resurrected blind. So we need to keep that balance, that the way to in this very world, being blind can be a means of blessing and mercy for someone. If the tables are turned and we are presented blind in the court of Allah, then that is the greatest loss for every single person. Allah protect us all from this. Some people go through very different difficulties in their life. My Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I swear by Allah, has not left any table unturned. There is something called, many of you will know, when a person has an epileptic seizure, so when a person faints, for some it happens more constant, for some in a period, in a day, it'll happen two or three times, if it's very severe, they have epileptic fits, where they're walking, or they might be swimming, and all of a sudden they drop. And there are certain signs, uh, the pharmacists will know, the doctors will know, that they start shaking, you'll see them drooling, you'll see them <coughs> reacting a certain way, their body freezes up, etc. They're epileptic fits. Is this something for me and you to be concerned about? So many scientists actually say that there isn't a cure. You can try to control the amount of times it happens, but to completely eradicate and take it away from a person's life is very difficult. Is there anything mentioned from my and your Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There is a hadith in both Sahih Muslim and in Sahih Bukhari, wherein Ata ibn Abi Rabah rahimahullahu ta'ala qal, who is Ata ibn Abi Rabah? Ata ibn Abi Rabah was a great, great tabi'i, one who was blessed to see the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Amongst his teachers was Aisha radiallahu anha and Abu Huraira. He lived to the age of 80 years. He was a hafiz of the Quran and he was also a hafiz of hadith who memorized over 10,000 words of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Qala ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma Ibn Abbas, who is his teacher, who is a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu said to me, Ala urika imra'atan min ahlil jannah. O Atta, 
Shall I show you a woman from the people of Jannah? So he's a tabi who is seeing the companions. Ibn Abbas says, Shall I show you a woman who is from the people of Jannah? Don't ever be in this wrong uh, notive that only the Ashara and Mubashara, the ten that were given glad tidings of Jannah, are the only ones to be given the glad tidings of Jannah. That is not the case. We find in many other hadith, many other companions were given the glad tidings of Jannah. Wajabat il Jannah, 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 Wajabat, Wajabat. Different, different situations, different times. Rasulullah said Jannah for this companion, Jannah for that companion. However, in the hadith of Muslim Sharif, we find Abdul Rahman ibn Auf who says in one sitting, Rasulullah said 10 names in one go. Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Uthman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah, Talha fil Jannah, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas fil Jannah, Sa'id fil Jannah, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf fil Jannah. And that's how Rasulullah said. Many others were given the glad tidings of Jannah. I will give you an example. Rasulullah was sitting in a gathering and he says that through this door a man will enter. I swear by Allah he is a man of Jannah. One of his companions on hearing this, he, Amr, uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Asr radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, he seeing this, he wanted to observe the why. Second day, Rasulullah says, through this door, a man, of, a man of Jannah, a person of Jannah will enter. Three times Rasulullah said it regarding the same man. So Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he went away and he said to him, he made an excuse, like, can I stay with you a few nights? I'm going through a bit of a difficulty. Can I have some space in your house, please? Oh, no problem. So he spent time with this companion and he spent three whole nights as is the way of a guest that you should stay max three nights. After staying three nights, he says to him, to this companion, that look, I made an excuse to stay with you and I was trying to observe you in them three nights. I wanted to know uh, what is it about you because regarding you, I heard the messenger of Allah say three times over on three occasions on, on three days that he is a man of Jannah, he is a person of Jannah. I want to know why is it? I don't see anything different. I spent three days with you. There's nothing different. You pray like us. You eat like us. You offer salah the way we do. Nothing extra, nothing less, nothing more. Nothing extra about you. Because I don't know. There's, there's nothing about me. I'm just a normal guy. I don't do anything. So the companion walks away. Actually, one second. Wait up. There is something. But, you know, it's something different maybe. So I say, Please tell me. Well, why is it? Because every night before I sleep, every single night before I sleep, I have a contemplation of my life. And I think about all the people that might have hurt me that day. This person, that person, whoever may have hurt me. And before I sleep, every single night, I make a promise to Allah. That, oh Allah, I have forgiven every single person that's ever hurt me today, yesterday, whenever. Oh Allah, I've forgiven them. And I sleep every night forgiving every single person that's ever done anything wrong to me. The companion said, I swear by Allah, that is that very reason why you have been promised Jannah, for being able to forgive others. Now, uh, Ata ibn Abi Rabah, and uh, ibn Abbas says to him, shall I tell you, shall I show you a woman of Jannah? فَقُلْتُ بَلَا Ata said, please. قَالَ هَذِ امْرَأَةُ السَّوْدَ أَتَتِ النَّبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. So ibn Abbas pointed towards a woman who was next to the masjid, this woman. And specifically, Sauda, she was a black woman. So she wasn't of, a, of an Arab background. She was a black woman who had migrated to Medina Munawwara. She is a woman of Jannah. Why? Because I heard Rasulullah say, sallallahu alayhi wasallam." She went to the Messenger of Allah and she said, فَقَالَتْ إِنِّي أُسْرَعُ O Messenger of Allah, I have epileptic seizures. I have fits and I fall over. And whilst I'm going through my day-to-day -day life, I have epileptic fits. And when I faint, when I have these fits, what happens is my body parts are exposed. Obviously, if you fall and without any notice, you know, parts of my body parts are exposed. Her hands, her legs, whatever it may be, is exposed. O Messenger of Allah, please make dua for me. Rasulullah said, In shi'ti walak, in shi'ti sabarti walak il jannah. If you have patience upon this calamity of yours, these epileptic seizures, these epileptic fits, if you have patience upon it, then for, for you will be Jannah. Or, وَإِن شِئْتَ دَعُوتُ اللَّهَ تَعَلَىٰ أَيُّ عَفِيكِ Or I can make dua to Allah. If you want, I can make dua to Allah. Oh Allah, please remove this illness from her. Inshallah, Allah will accept my dua. He is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa فَقَالَتْ So she's got a choice. Have patience, carry on with these fits. Or I will make dua and 
inshallah you will be cured. So she could either have patience or she could ask for the dua to be cured. What does she say? فَقَالَتْ أَصْبِرُوا I will have patience. Rasulullah said to her, if you have patience for you will be Jannah. On hearing this, أَصْبِرُوا I have patience. إِنِّي أَتَكَشَّفُوا However, Messenger of Allah, when I do have this fits, I don't want it to be the case that my body parts are exposed. Such was her modesty and how, how much she appreciated her own beauty. How much she appreciated the fact that I am only for my family members. I am only specific for my husband. I am only specific for those eyes that can see me with whom Allah will be happy for them to see me. She really looked after her beauty. She looked, looked after herself. And that's very, very important. This is a woman who's having fits and at that moment, if, you've, if parts of your body are exposed, what does that mean? It's not her fault. But she feels that concern that at that moment, this happens to me. So she says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, فَادْعُوا Allah and لَا تَكَشَّفْ I don't mind having the fits, I don't mind having these seizures and these epileptic fits. But Messenger of Allah, please make that much a dua for me, that when I do have these fits, that my body parts don't be, ex- uh, don't be exposed. I just want to be protected. I want to protect my honor, my beauty. Rasulullah said, فَدْعَا لَهَا Rasulullah made dua for her. So she was a, she's a woman of Jannah. Why? Because after Rasulullah ibn Abbas says, this is a woman of Jannah. She continues to have these fits. But guess what? The historians mentioned whenever she used to have these seizures, it was the way of Allah that when she would fall, when she would have a fit, never would her body parts be exposed after the dua of the Prophet <coughs> But she still had them fits. Why? Because she was promised Jannah on, uh, in the repayance of these fits. So any difficulty... Wallahi al-Azim, now Imam Bukhari, Imam Nawi, rahmatullahi, in the next two, three hadiths, is going to mention to every person sitting here, no matter if someone sitting here saying, Alhamdulillah, I don't have cancer. Alhamdulillah, I don't have fits. What about the struggles that we go through in life? We all go through hard times. We all go through hard times. We all are tested with different, different things in our life. Is there any significance to them? Will we be rewarded upon them? Let's find out. When Abi Abdul Rahman, Abdul Ibn Mas'ud, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, قال, كأني أنظر إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يحكي نبيا من الأنبياء عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عنه he says that it is as though I can see he is relating a hadith it is as though I can see the messenger of Allah relating the story of one of the prophets of Allah صلوات الله وسلامه عليهم may the mercy and peace of Allah be upon all of them ضربه قومه his nation Injured him, his nation hurt him. Fa'ad mawhu, and they made him bleed. Wa huwa yamsahu dam an wajhihi. And this Prophet of Allah, Rasulullah is saying this story, and this Prophet of Allah, he is wiping the blood away from his face. And then the Prophet of Allah says, Yakul, Allahumma fir li qawmi, fa innahum la ya'lamun. O my Allah, please forgive my nation, indeed they don't know. A very significant point here is Imam Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, master of hadith says, when Rasulullah said this story, that I will tell you a story of a prophet of the past, or, or of a prophet, that his people hurt him to such an extent they made him bleed, that he was washing and moving the blood away from his face. And after that, he said to Allah, Allahumma khfirli qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive my nation, they don't know. Imam Qurutubi says, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, Rasulullah is not telling us a story of a, uh, of a prophet of the past. He is referring to himself on the day of Uhud when he was attacked and when his blood was dripping from his face. It was at that moment that Rasulullah made this dua. Oh Allah, they don't know. They have ignorance, they don't know. When Rasulullah went to Ta'if, the most famous dua, Allahumma ilayka ashku du'fa quwwati wa killata hilati wa hawani ala nas when Rasulullah was presented with Jibreel, with Jibreel salam, I will crush these people of Taif. For Rasulullah said, Oh Allah, I complain to you of my weakness. I complain to you that I didn't have the means to propagate your deen. That I don't have what it takes. I don't have the voice. I don't have anything. I complain to you that I don't have anything. It's my weakness. Not the weakness of these people. They don't know. They don't know. Please forgive them. Please forgive them. Rasulullah is speaking about himself. On the battle of Uhud, he said, Oh Allah, please forgive my people. فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ They don't know. With that in mind, how can, you, how can me and you sit here and judge people all the time? That, oh, this sister doesn't pray, that brother doesn't pray. Yeah, they don't pray now. When did you start praying? When did you start praying that you're okay to judge someone else? 
Oh yeah, she doesn't wear hijab. Okay, she doesn't wear hijab. We do recognize that it's not good. We do recognize that it is something wrong. When did you put your hijab on? When did you put your hijab on? Yeah, he doesn't pray salah though. He doesn't uh, practice upon the sunnah. When, when did you start practicing upon the sunnah? Who are me and you? Are we really going to judge people on their progress? Are we not meant to help people out? Is it not meant to be the case that I found truth? I know that there is goodness in hijab. I know there is goodness in salah. And now it's my point now to really go up to them and say to them that I'm here to help you. Hassan Basri rahimahullah ta'ala was asked a question. A question of fiqh. Sheikh, I know of a person who doesn't pray salah. What's the ruling? Is he a kafir? Some ulama have said, you don't pray salah, kafir. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal says, you're a kafir. You're a disbeliever, you left the fold of Islam. Imam Abu Dawood Sahiri, rahimahullah, says, kafir. You don't pray one salah, you left the fold of Islam. So someone came to Sheikh Hassan al-Bisri, who is a great, great tabi'i. Great, great uh, tabi'i who related the hadith, from, uh, he's known for his hadith. He was the master who Imam Bukhari mentions many times in Sahih Bukhari. He was asked, Hassan al-Bisri, what's the ruling for a person who doesn't pray salah? Listen to his answer, and this is the answer that me and you need. When Hassan Basri was asked, what's the ruling when a person doesn't pray salah? He said, the ruling is, you grab him by his hand, you hug him, and you take him to the masjid to pray salah. That's the ruling for salah. That's the ruling for a person who doesn't pray salah. That you make an active effort to help him. Today we're so quick to judge people. We're so quick to name and shame everyone. Help them, man. Help them. They need mine and your help. If you have found goodness in deen, then my spouse needs goodness in deen. My brother needs goodness in deen. My sister needs goodness in deen. The upsetting thing is, we don't help each other. We're ready to name and shame and say that I'm better than you. No one's better than anyone in the, in the sight of Allah in this world. The true better people, we will find on the day of Qiyamah exactly who is better, who is not. Allah make us amongst those people who help each other to find Allah. Next hadith. وَنَ أَبِي سَعِيدٍ أَبُوَ أَبِي هُرِيرَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُمَا لِلنَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ Now this is from me and you. مَا يُسِيبُ الْمُسْلِمَ مِنْ نَسَبٍ Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم says, A believer, nasab, fatigue comes to him. وَلَا وَسَبْ Illness comes to him. وَلَا حَمِّ Stress, grief comes to him. وَلَا حَزَنٍ Worry comes to him. وَلَا أَذَان Some sort of physical pain, injury comes to him. وَلَا غَمٍ Anxiety comes to him. حَتَّى الشَّوْكَةُ يُشَاكُهَا To the extent that even if something pricks a believer, a thorn pricks him, he's walking by and a glass pricks him or a thorn pricks him. Anything harms him, anything gives him some sort of injury. إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِنْ خَطَايَا But that is Allah expiating his sins. Allah is removing his sins from him. So whatever difficulty you have as a believer, Wallahi Azim, that difficulty is Allah cleaning you from your wrongs. It's Allah cleaning you from your wrongs. Every depression that a person faces, I feel depressed. Allah wants you to turn back to Him. Allah wants to forgive you. I'm worried. You're worried that, you know, that extra heaviness on the mind, that I'm stressed about something. Even that is a means of Allah forgiving your sins. That stress of work, of family, pressure at home, pressure with our partners, pressure with our children, pressure with everything. Wallahi al-Azim, if you have Allah in front of you, all of them things are a means of Allah forgiving you. That's why we go through these hard points. And when a person says, Allah doesn't love me, that's why I go through a hard time. No, Allah loves you, that's why you're going through a hard time. That's why. Some people message me saying, Ustadji, please make dua, I'm going through a hard time, I don't know what to do, I feel really down. My answer is, I say by Allah, Allah loves you, because when you feel down, you need something, you need Allah in your life. And Allah is saying to you, I'm letting you go through this, so then you realize that Muhammad can't help me, Sheikh can't help me, uh, Shaheed can't help me, Abbas can't help me, no one can help me, but Allah. So Allah gives you these difficulties, so you actually make a point to go back to Allah. That's what the key to these difficulties are. And who went through any far difficulty than me and you? Final hadith for today, I'm going to end it on this. This is a hadith of uh, Ibn Mas'ud. Who is Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu? Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu is that very companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who is the sixth person to accept Islam. Sixth in number. After Khadija, Abu Bakr, Ali, Zayd radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, after Uthman, we have um, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He was, how great was he? 
He was sent to Kufa at the time of, which is in Iraq today, at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. When Umar was the Khalifa of Islam, he wanted to select someone to be the governor and to be the leader, Islamic uh, priest, the pious scholar for Kufa. He selected Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud taught Islam in Kufa. When he was now returning back to Medina because he was becoming ill and old, he wanted to pass away in the blessed city of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa When he was leaving Kufa, we find 4,000 scholars that he had made, his 4,000 students came to the border of Kufa just to say goodbye to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He narrates from us, uh, 848 hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, دَخَلْتُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَهُوَ يُعَكُ I went to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he had a fever. فَقُلْتُ I said to him, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ O Messenger of Allah, إِنَّكَ تُعَكُ وَعْكًا شَدِيدًا O Messenger of Allah, I see that you have a very severe fever. Very severe, very high fever. قال أجل صلى الله عليه وسلم said أجل yes إني عوأك كما يوأك رجلان منكم indeed my fever is equivalent to the fever of two of your men meaning the fever and the pain that two men feel I am feeling that as one person قلت Abdullah Abdullah Masoud says I said ذلك أن لك أجرين does that mean you will get a double reward قال صلى الله عليه وسلم أجل yes ذَلِكَ كَذَلِكَ مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ يُسِيبُهُ أَذَنٍ Yes, I will be getting a double reward. The ulama mentioned no one has experienced any more pain, any more difficulty than the messengers of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And from all of the messengers, Rasulullah went through the greatest of all of difficulty. It's why he will be given the greatest reward. Then Rasulullah, he didn't just speak about himself. He didn't just say, yes, I will be given double reward. He reminded Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, for me, you, for every Muslim, مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ يُسِيبُهُ أَذَنْ When a believer goes through a difficulty, شَوْكَةٌ فَمَا فَوْقَهَا Even a small thorn that pricks him, or a thorn that pricks her, even a harsh statement from someone else, when someone says something wrong to you and it hurts for a few minutes, when someone says, you're this, and even though they say in a jokey way, or in a sarcastic way, it really hurts, even that, when someone says to someone that you're fat, and even though they're saying in a jokey way, you know it hurts you, even that, إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا سَيِّئَاتِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that as an excuse to forgive your sins. In what way? وَحُتَّتْ عَنْهُ ثُنُوبُهُ Your sins will fall off your body كَمَا تَحُتُّ الشَّجَرَةُ وَرَقَهَا The way you have a tree in autumn and the leaves are just about to fall and you, rather than waiting for it to fall, you grab a branch and you start shaking it and automatically it falls off because it's autumn, it's about to fall off anyway. Rasulullah explains that your sins fall off in that way. A small little shake and them sins will fall off. From this, the message for me and you is that our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa went through a hard time. But because he went through a hard time, he will be given the greatest of reward, which is maqam e mahmud which is going to be the most elevated and the most greatest praiseworthy station on the day of Qiyamah, that no one will be given it. But for me and you as a Muslim, the message that Imam Nawawi is giving to me and you, and in this chapter of Sabbath, for every single person, no matter, everyone's difficulty is different. What I go through, what you go through will be different. I will feel as though my difficulty is the most difficult situation in the world. But keep in mind, whatever difficulty you are going through, I swear by Allah, if you are patient upon it, if you have hope in Allah, you're going to get rewarded really well. Allah is going to forgive your sins. Allah is going to elevate you. Allah is going to give you more. And you know what's more? There's 40 guys sitting here, we've got another however many people listening at home and wherever this voice of mine will go. We go through different, different difficulties. There are some people sitting at home that they're finding it hard to marry. Why? Because of one or two situations. There are some people at home that they've had a fallout with their partner. There are some people sitting at home, they're depressed. There's something gone wrong in their life at work or with someone else. There's someone that's right now lost a brother or even a child or even their father there's someone else sitting at home going through a difficulty everyone is having some sort of difficulty in their life we don't need to plaster out our difficulties to the world I don't need to sit there and tell the whole world that this is my difficulty no we just need to tell Allah just learn to tell Allah and when it comes to telling Allah I don't mean that you just sit in the corner at the darkness of the night on the prayer mat lift your hands and say to Allah right Allah I'm going to speak to you you don't need to speak to Allah in that way. 
إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ Allah is the one that can listen to your heart. So even if you're walking, even if you're smiling in front of everyone, but inside you're going through a difficulty, and while smiling at everyone, you are feeling that difficulty and you are speaking to Allah. To Allah, I'm smiling, I'm putting up a show, but there's a difficulty in my life. And you are talking to Allah in that way. I swear by Allah, behind that smile, Allah can hear that difficulty of yours. But we need to turn and talk to Him. Many people, we resolve to everything else. Difficulty, I need to ask dua from this person, that person. Yes, ask dua from a pious person. Yes, ask from someone else. But if I'm being honest with you, that pious person, your difficulty, I'm sorry to put it like this, your difficulty doesn't mean anything to them. I'm sorry. They'll make dua for you. They'll have a concern for five minutes. I'll listen to your story. I'll cry over it for ten minutes. But then tomorrow, I'm going to be busy with my own worry again. So the greatest dua is your dua that you make for yourself. And that means make a positive change. We're not saying that today everyone's going to go home and everyone's going to start getting the prayer mat out and we're going to put our fanjabis and our jubbas on and we're going to be all pious. No. But make a start. Talk to Allah. The more you will talk to Allah in your heart and mind, automatically a time will come that, Ya Allah, I'm talking to you, I'm asking you so much. But how can I forget that the greatest way to ask you is through salah? I need to start praying salah now. Ya Allah, I'm praying salah. I only pray my first. I only pray zahar, fajr, isha, whatever. But... I know there's other times to ask from you. I need to wake up at the night now. Oh Allah, I wake up at the night, I do everything. But then with people, I'm so wrong. I pretend to be so pious in front of you, in front of your core, but with my friends, with my family, I'm a tyrant, I'm evil. Oh Allah, I need to sort myself out. And automatically everything starts to get sorted out. But it starts off with a clean intention. So everyone sitting here, I'm not going to make you put your hand up. I'm not going to make anyone sitting at home put their hand up, even though I can't see them putting their hand up. But I'm going to say this much to you. Please, if you are listening to what I'm saying and it means something to you, in your heart, just make that intention. That, oh Allah, it's true. Forget everyone. Forget what this guy is doing, what this girl is doing. Oh Allah, I want to become a better person. May the Almighty Allah Ta'ala allow me and you to turn back to Allah. Inshallah, next week, <coughs> Imam Nawi Rahmatullahi Alayhi will speak to me and you about a few more points. That are, there is a point of losing family members. Then there is patience upon other things that we need to think about. Inshallah, Imam Nawawi, I pray that possibly next week we will finish the chapter of patience, Ababu Salat. May the Almighty Allah Ta'ala accept from us. May become, the, may become so that Allah forgives us, Allah accepts from us, and Allah Ta'ala makes us amongst His most pious servants. And what does it mean to be pious? Showing the people? No. Such pious servants that even if the world doesn't know us, Allah knows that I'm His friend. And that's all we need. Uh, literally one or two announcements. I'm sorry for taking everyone's time. First one is, Alhamdulillah, the way we have every week Friday Hadith class, it's been three lessons now, every Monday now. We have a Monday Tafsir class where we are discussing the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know Hadith is a very powerful effect, it's a very powerful reminder, but let me remind you the book of Allah is far greater. It is the words of Allah. These are the words of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which has its merits, which has its power and its station. But the book of Allah is far greater. In a Hadith we find that the superiority of the words of Allah in comparison to every other word is like the superiority of Allah over the, His entire creation. So on Monday, we have something called Monday Tafsir. Same place, 9 till 10. We have started Surah Baqarah, alhamdulillah. We've had three lessons so far. And this Friday Hadith class has been ongoing without a miss, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, for over 160 Fridays now. So it's been three years now, alhamdulillah, that we have had this class of Friday Hadith class. We finished one book. Al-Adab al-Mufrid, that took three years. And we've had our tenth lesson of Riyadh al-Salihin. I pray the Almighty Allah Ta'ala accepts from us all. And I ask that you all make dua. And please, just don't go back listening to one hour bayan. Try to make a difference in your life. And that difference, I'm not going to ask for much. Even if you go back thinking about what I've said, about how every difficulty that you're going through is a test from Allah and Allah loves you. Today's talk, today's hadith class, everything about it has been successful in my eyes. Alhamdulillah. May the Almighty Allah accept. So Monday, tafsir, 9 till 10. And Friday we have our hadith class. And inshallah, every other week when there's something else going on, I will notify you all. Please do make dua for me. May Allah ta'ala accept from you all. I've been quite ill this week. Ill meaning I've not felt well. I've, I cancelled all of my lessons this week from Monday, after Monday till Friday. I didn't teach anything. I, I normally have class on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I had to say sorry to every single person that I wasn't too well. So please make dua for me Allah gives me strength. Jazakallah khair. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah al-Azim. Astaghfirullah wa